important for everyone to recognize that mental health is not some made up concept. But at the end of the day, think about the kind of mental health support that you want to receive from your peers. Hey everyone, welcome to new podcast series of Hear Quiz Stories, Stronger Together Amidst Adversities in Southeast Asia, brought to you by Came Out of the Closet and Asian Sogi Caucus. Series of podcast episodes which will be made available both in our Spotify account as well as in YouTube. It's intended really to bring so much space for LGBTI voices from Southeast Asia to be heard, to share our stories, and also to find out how folks like us will be able to work together in transforming the ASEAN region. Welcome to our podcast series, Here Quiz Stories. Listen to the LGBTIQ narrative from Southeast Asia in collaboration with ASEAN Sogi Caucus, with Farah, Prab, and Rhys. This series is on Stronger Together Amidst Adversities as a queer community in a time of pandemic in Southeast Asia covering six episodes and featuring multiple queer guest speakers all across the region. And today is the fifth episode of the series. We will be discussing the topic around queer and well. How do we promote our mental health? Mental health is one of the major and key concerns that many of our quibblings have expressed. Many groups have conducted research on the impact of COVID-19 on LGBTIQ persons and found out that it's heavily affected the mental health of our rainbow community. They've ventured into programs to promote the mental health and well-being of their LGBTIQ members, making it more accessible for them. We have to recognize that mental health is an inherent part of our right to health. Unfortunately, mental health programs are still inaccessible, costly, and sometimes excluding LGBTIQ persons. So, how can we start to deal with our mental health issues? Today, we have Ashraf, a professional and certified counsellor from Malaysia, and Ken Koo from people like Us Hangout, Fluho, Malaysia. Ken is a coordinator of the Global Project at Fluho, and the project that is focusing on queer affirmative therapy. First question, as LGBTQIA plus faces more layers of discrimination and limitations in life, how is the recent condition of mental health issues in the LGBTQIA plus community in Southeast Asia? How has this condition affected us as an individual? Let's begin with Ashraf. Since the emergence of COVID, uh, everyone has been experiencing an immense impact from not only from the, the pandemic or the, but also being impacted by the, the after effect of, of the, the disease uh, that, that now restricts us from having ability to engage people. We have been confined to, to, so to speak, you know, four walls within our own house or a room. Uh, we were removed from interaction or even go out to socialize. And, um, you know, there are also a lot of other incidents where aggravated uh, incident of domestic violence and you know mental health issues taking place at home as well too so imagine the experience that everyone else had to go through uh, during the past two to three years because of the pandemic and amplify that by uh, maybe a layer or two uh, towards the lgbtq community the community of lgbtq has another layer of stress that they have to deal with uh, not only with whatever the, the remaining of the population had to go through, um, living as an LGBTQ plus person in Southeast Asia, it's not going to be as easy as uh, you know some other parts of the world as compared to us, right? So just as much as uh, the mental health issue has become a big theme nowadays for the general population, it has also become a bigger theme to the LGBTQ plus community as well. So as we look at the past research, trends and also uh, inclination of people from our community to be a bit more susceptible to be depressed or having uh, PTSD symptoms to a certain extent. People are also having societal ideation and some also went into the point of attempting suicide, you know, let alone using multiple substances to either dilute stress or try to cope with the fact that um, they are being marginalized, stigmatized, being discriminated against for being part of the community members. So this has been quite prevalent in the past few years across the Southeast Asia region. 
severely impacted by uh, the recent pandemic situation, the fact that our community belong to a bit more of a marginalized uh, community and not being widely accepted uh, due to various stigmatization, discrimination, and also negative connotation that the implication of mental health is even amplified for um, uh, our community that leads to you know, various mental health conditions such as depression, stress, anxiety. Thank you so much, Ash, for your insight. In Southeast Asia, we definitely have seen our mental health being affected, especially things like employment, society, being at home. They really affect our mental health for LGBTQIA plus community. This brings me to the next question. Why do you think it's important to recognize mental health issues? I think it's very important, not just, not just for our community. It's important for everyone to recognize that mental health is not some made-up concept been perpetrated by media, it is such an important element of our daily life. Nobody gets to do things if their mind and their body and also their emotions are not in sync. We are all created with these three big components of being able to think, react in terms of how do we behave and emote. When we are missing one of this component that is integral to the way we function every single day, that would basically then lead to us not being able to fully function in either in our daily dealings, uh, you know, like for example, going to school or, or going to work, engage our friends, family members, or society at large, or let alone being able to perform tasks. So to me, to recognize the fact that mental health is not is just an issue, but we should be recognizing mental health as an integral component of daily living. To me, you know, being able to really realize that having a sound mental state, being able to regulate our emotion, being able to behave in a manner that it is acceptable to the society, being able to express the way that we are supposed to be expressing ourselves, would then reflect on our mental health because we feel safe, because we feel that we are cared for, we feel that we are included, right? And this would then relate to how do we put ourselves forward in everything that we do, right? Whether it's in our job or whether our daily things with our family members or other people, or whether it, whether it is actually with ourselves. If we think of physical health as an important thing, we should be thinking the same with our mental health as well. Thank you so much, Ash. I like how you emphasize that we have to take care of our mental health the same as our physical health. What about you, Ken? I think Ash has done a really good job of essentially explaining, setting the scene and the context for COVID-19 as being a difficult time, not just for LGBTQ people, but generally for everyone. It was a, an extraordinary time of isolation. And with isolation comes a deprivation of psychosocial support. You suddenly no longer have the direct support, perhaps, that you would normally get from your routine, which may include going out with friends, which may include or play some kind of team sports with friends. Um, all of that was essentially put on hold for the period of lockdown. A few different things. I think the first one to keep in mind, and it's not just for LGBTQ people, it's also for a lot of women, it's also for a lot of children, that sometimes home is not a safe space. The idealized version of home is a space of love and a space of warmth and a space of safety. That isn't always the case. And with what Ash mentioned earlier, such as domestic violence cases. These are just examples of how prolonged tension and prolonged stress and prolonged proximity with people that may not treat you healthily can exacerbate and cause violence, whether that's physical violence or emotional violence or a sense of danger, a sense of unsafety. And, and I think this is exceptionally common with queer people, especially in, I would say, Southeast Asia generally. Of course, it would vary very much based on the context of each country. But I, I think as a whole, Asian countries have yet to embrace queerness as some of the Western countries. What we saw, and so I can speak only for the context of Malaysia, which is where I'm from, and the context of the community from which I come. What we saw when the pandemic kind of swept the nation and lockdown became the new norm, we saw on online spaces a lot of requests and essentially cries for help from within the community of people who needed a sense of support and a sense of community because what were safe spaces were now no longer so-called 
pretty much didn't exist anymore because queer spaces, which existed usually as underground spaces or events and bars, clubs, for example, even friendly hangouts, all of that couldn't take place during the strictest lockdown. So that really was the impetus and the realization that became essentially the Bluebird Project as it is now. It started off as a realization that huge spike in people seeking support and connection online and realizing that despite myself and others in my organization not being mental health professionals and not mental health trained, what we realized was that we, we could do essentially a referral service or a connecting service where we, we help people to access and help people, to, at least on a peer level, get some sort of emotional support. But I think the fact that being queer is not accepted across the board here makes homes an unsafe space and can in, in fact increase pressure and stress. Statistically, we also know that um, according to minority stress theory, we know that minorities tend to have a higher tendency of developing mental health issues just because they go through, they face rejection or essentially stresses in their everyday lives, which cum accumulate and eventually trigger higher susceptibility to whether that's depression, anxiety, or any other form of mental health illness or unwellness. So um, layering all of this on to each other, the pandemic was just kind of, in a way for many people, the straw that broke the camel's back. Moving on to the second question, I think exactly as what Ash had already said, for example, of a cold and we can recognize a flu and we can recognize, we all learn by heart the symptoms of COVID-19. We know, for example, to check. We know for people who are susceptible to heart attacks, like we know, we learn these warning signs and so that we can see it coming and we check and we test ourselves and we go for blood tests and we check on our regular health. And so catching it early, just like with cancer, is a big step in being able to treat yourselves. And so with mental health issues, it's the same, where if we are more in touch with our emotions and we can know ourselves and know our stresses and detect a breakdown before the breakdown happens, that lets us address the issue and essentially avoid what would otherwise be a pretty catastrophic emotional event. So, I mean, I think recognition is the first step to solving any kind of problem. Thank you so much, Ken, for the insight. How do you think we should start to bring a more inclusive environment for the LGBTQIA plus community? I think he did give us a bit of insight on previously what Pluho was doing at the Bluebird Project. Can you tell us more about queer affirmative therapy? Do you think this could be adopted by other organizations in Southeast Asia? Can it be adopted by other organizations in the region? I think absolutely. What we essentially have done is, um, I think, something that doesn't require any particular specialized knowledge or training. We've So maybe a bit of context about what Pluho has done with the Bluebird Project. It started off a response to what we saw as like a big surge in our communities asking for mental health support. And uh, as an organization that is, as a community organization, none of us are therapists ourselves. What we could do in that case was essentially connect people because we couldn't provide the specialist care. We were, we're not counselors or clinical psychologists or psychiatrists. But what we did have was word of mouth. And what we did have was a list that we had gotten from friends. And, and this is something I think that you will find in many communities, especially queer communities, as existing maybe as an informal or an unwritten resource. Just as you would ask for recommendations about, let's say, which or which doctor is good, um, you would also do the same thing with your therapist in many cases. And especially in countries where being queer is not generally accepted, it becomes an important assurance to queer people to know that their therapist is at the very least friendly to queer people. The last thing that we feel a person who goes for therapy should experience is a rejection or a denial or an invalidation of what is their soji, uh, of what is part of their core identity. We started off with what we didn't want to happen. And from there, we built on this service. So we knew that we wanted to create a more formalized way of being able to share recommendations with people in the community. While this was happening within small circles of friends, I could reach out to my friend. And this kind of emotion, informational currency is not always accessible to everyone. I happen to be privileged in the sense that I had uh, queer colleagues and I had queer friends that I had met through events. And therefore, I had people that I could ask about if I needed to seek out queer affirmative mental health support. But that isn't the case for everyone and especially not the case of people who may be discreet or may not be willing to disclose publicly that they are queer. So how in that how can we then provide a service that is mindful of that discretion but also has a sense of assurance to it that the people that we will refer to you is going to be queer affirming. So it started off uh, very simply as a Google form that people could fill up. And from there we then curated a list. There was a list that was initially uh, created by another activist and 
local, a local mental health organization. They had put a list together through Queer Lapis, which is one of Malaysia's, one of the only queer news portals here. And so there was a, initially already a, a survey that was sent out. And using the findings from that survey, we then distilled the list down and found, uh, and also conducted interviews of our own to connect with these therapists and then to ask them about their experience, also to ask them about their willingness to continue working with the community. And from there, that was essentially how the project started. And so when you see it broken down, it really isn't anything that requires specialized knowledge. We didn't develop any kind of syllabus. All we did was just put in the work and and reach out for help. Uh, And at the end of the day, that's really how mental health uh, support is given. It's not something that you can force upon someone uh, and that would not be consensual and that would be probably like very unethical. But in the same way that we essentially ask people to share their recommendations, we ask therapists if they wanted to work. That's also, that also applies to people who may be finding themselves in a difficult place and may not know who to reach out to. Just ask anyone. It could be a random person on an app. It could be your best friend. It could be anyone that makes you feel safe. You'd be surprised that how tight the network is. And usually one way or another, you'll find someone who has the information you need. Thank you so much, Ken. I really like what the Bluebird Project is doing. I really hope Singapore, where I'm from, would really have the access to mental health resources because a lot of us, including myself, are going through a lot of issues. Next question, Ash. As a professional counsellor, tell us about your experience and your individual moral efforts in an enabling environment for queer people accessing more inclusive counselling services. And what message for other counsellors out there when to be more LGBTQIA plus inclusive? We're going to speak this a bit localised to the Malaysian context. I think what Ken had shared here yeah, with regards to the network of access in the queer community can reach out to at the current moment is still limited. The, the queer community or rather the population is not well served due to various reasons, right? And uh, you know, a lot of us feel a bit uncomfortable sharing about our sexuality, regardless whether we are being out and uh, open about it or still somehow rather try to mask our identity for whatever reason. Of course, when it comes to therapists out there, be, being counsellors, clinical psychologists, or even psychiatrists, the faculties that we have right now does not necessarily serve the community as a form of base. To have an initiative like the uh, Bluebird Project would really help to build that awareness, not just for our community members, but also to the mental health faculty members to realize that there is a need to also educate and improve their level of understanding of the needs within queer, uh, the queer population itself. You know, understand the nuances, the challenges, the requirements that uh, the population would request out of uh, the mental health providers out there. Uh, personally as a therapist, I started off by engaging the minority population. I call it as minority population because these are the underserved po- uh, population. Uh, we are referring to you know, the undocumented individuals, referring to women, we are referring to underprivileged individuals in Malaysia, and we are also referring to those who are less represented, like the queer community. Most often than not, our community members out there just do not know where to go to. If they look it up on the internet, Google it up and try to find any therapies out there that would, they are specially trained, challenging to find one out there. So to have an initiative like the Bluebird Project and other NGOs or CDOs who are focusing on the key population really helps to create that awareness, build that message and also provide a touch point for uh, people out there to seek out for relevant support. And it also help people like myself as a therapist to know where can I render my support to the community as well too. Right now, as, as we speak, we do see an increase of new budding psychologists, counsellors in trying to expand their line of sight uh, to serve a wider range of community members uh, uh, in, in Malaysia as well too. Personally, like, for myself, what I have been doing, you know, uh, is to, to work closely with various CDOs and NGOs to, to render my pro bono support um, services or even at a discounted rate to help build that reach for uh, our community members. At the same time, also promoting to other 
you know, upper team members within the mental health community to make them realize that, hey, the general population would require just as much as the uh, queer community requires the same as well too. To have more people like myself and others who are willing to take that one step ahead and really claim that we are willing and able, we'll try our best to support the community, we'll hopefully become a snowball effect to uh, the rest of other community members as well too. And hopefully, it would then going to implicate the way uh, the system works as well. And when I say the system is not just about, but also to upskill our, our mental health faculty members but to understand a bit more about the population through formal education in their, their degree programs or their masters or even PhD program to include a, a, a bit more focus on to a specific group of minorities. My experience has always been working closely with and be uh, NGOs, CDOs, build that network, going around and try to influence other uh, other mental health community members to also be interested in, 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 in this particular population. And so attending other uh, you know events like what we are having right now, hopefully to really make it known to the general public or even to our community members that they are not alone. They are people who are willing to support the community. And uh, there are ways where we can build those connection and uh, can build those touch points uh, for people to access um, services. And my message for other counselors out there, if you're listening to this particular podcast, hopefully good reasons you get somehow to chat with them is to really you know open their arms and shoulders and their heart uh, for patients out there who also needs our support, who also require our professional service, who also um, you know would be looking forward to, to be able to be themselves. I have a question also of Ken. What is the most important message and advice that you have that you can share with other people? When it comes to the mental health for the LGBTQIA community, reach out and ask for help. It doesn't matter who you do it, you ask or what channel you use. You can always email our project email, which is bluebird at bluehole.org. Whether we can help you if you are not in Malaysia is, is a question, but regardless, we will do our best to connect you are possibly able to to any kind of local resources but i also really urge you to look at other things that other organizations and initiatives that are available depending on whatever country you're in so uh, one other organization that is doing very good mental health work is ugachaga in singapore they run a whatsapp i think and also maybe a telephone counseling service which is actually the one of the organizations we engaged early on in the process when we wanted to understand more about what it meant to provide community-based support. So if you're in Singapore, that's definitely one organization you can check out. Uh, and I'm sure there are many, many other ones in other countries as well. Just ask around in the community and you will find what you're looking for. So that's one of the messages that I had. I think another one, and this is maybe not specific to any one person, but just more of uh, something that I really believe in, is that ultimately mental health is within your power to reach out and seek help. But it's very much a collective responsibility that we have to take on. We are in many ways part of the community that we want to see. At the end of the day, think about the kind of mental health support that you want to receive from your peers. And then be that person who reaches out and offers, who drops a phone call to a friend you haven't heard from for a while, who checks in with your colleagues, who holds space for any kind of difficult conversations to happen, especially when you see one of your peers going through something that maybe they want to talk about, but they're not sure if it's safe to talk about. Open that door for that conversation to happen. Because one of the things about psychosocial support, it's in many cases just having a conversation about it, bringing it out into the open, getting it out of that dark, dark place that's in your head and, and bring it out into clear daylight, discuss it with a friend, bring some clarity to that picture. And that helps a lot with making that monster seem much, uh, seeing that monster is much, much smaller than it, it did in your head, where it's, you know, maybe dark and scary. So very much conversations, even just sharing can be helpful and being the person who can create that kind of environment, making yourself available if you want to, also telling your own story and through that, letting others also tell their own story. Thank you, Ken. That's really important. Yes, mental health is very important. Yeah, please do not be afraid to seek help. And how about for Ashra? The most important message I would like to put it out there is to, to normalize uh, mental health. 
right? And I think most often than not, people tend to associate mental health to a really scary narrative, you know, as if that once you had experienced difficulties in your life that means that you are crazy or you're you're no longer uh, and th- but that's not the case so everyone of us you know regardless of how do we associate or, or identify ourselves we're bound to experience difficulty in life like it or not you know, and that's the reality of you know living in this world we are ups and downs and then it's okay for us to be you know sometimes a bit less motivated or to feel a bit down when it comes to our um, uh, emotional or even our psychological uh, well-being to recognize the fact that we are not expected to be perfect all the time and to recognize the fact that we are not alone in this world there's always someone out there who will be able to you know give them a, a shoulder to cry on and it's okay to to be vulnerable and, uh, and and it's okay to feel that we need someone to hold our hand uh, it's okay for us to lean on to someone be it a friend be it a community member be it family members or whoever that person might be redefine what mental health really means is important to every individual who is still living and breathing in this Uh, world right now let's not stigmatize the word mental health the way that is being perceived right now but rather really look it from a different lens just like how much we are uh you know looking at physical health we should be looking the same way with mental health as well there are days where we might fall sick there are days where we are completely healthy the same goes with our mental health as well do not feel ashamed do not feel that you are less of someone out there who might be able to render try as much as possible to relieve that burden it is not a struggle that we all have to go through on our own and you know it is not a place where we should be feeling ashamed and that would be my my message to everyone out there look at this in a in a lighter perspective that we all have uh, the ability uh, to reach out we there are good people out there who's willing to lend a support and it is okay to feel down sometimes it is not a weakness it is just the reality of life where we are all humans and we are not worth thing thank you ashraf and ken for sharing with us this wonderful and important message and advice for the whole community yes and i agree like in this so we always think that we are alone there's no one there and then we feel down and yes you'll be surprised when you actually try to connect to someone out there and yep to our listeners please don't forget to follow pluho on instagram at pluho underscore org you feel down you can also connect with your local lgbtqia community groups to find out uh, your resources on where to check for your mental health and that's it for our fifth episode thank you for listening follow us on instagram at came out of the closet ig and asian sogi caucus catch the video on our facebook instagram and youtube stay tuned for our next episode